Hello, this is Chris Winfrinsoff from Not The Andrew Marr Show. We've been covering all the protests since October. If you want to see more of these, then please subscribe if you haven't already. It's uh, very inspiring to see so many people here. Uh, the fact that so many people uh, care about uh, not participating, not uh, condoning uh, this this genocide is uh, is at least a literal hope uh, hope in this uh, very dark time. Two weeks ago, Israel launched an attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, killing 16 people. This was a hugely provocative, illegal attack by Israel. But the way the media and the politicians talk about it, you'd think it was Iran that was on the offensive, that had committed that terrible crime, that it's Iran that wants to start a wider war. But the truth, friends, is this. It's Israel that launched the attack. It's Israel that's determined to whip up a wider war. And not only with Iran, with Lebanon too. Those attacks and the ensuing conflicts would be terrible. How many thousands would be added to the terrible death toll in Gaza? But the greatest catastrophe will come when Israel decides to use its nuclear weapons. Because Israel has a deadly arsenal of these weapons of mass destruction that can kill hundreds of thousands of people that can affect countless thousands more through radiation poisoning, causing cancers, miscarriages, and birth defects. Liz Israel can launch its nuclear weapons from land, sea, and air, and its arsenal is illegal, subject to no international scrutiny or regulation. But who helped Israel get these nuclear weapons? Who made Israel the only nuclear weapon state in the Middle East so it can act with impunity, holding this terrible threat over the lives of everyone in the region? I tell you, friends, it was Britain that made the Israeli bomb possible. It was Britain that sold 20 tonnes of heavy water to Israel with no safeguards against military use. It was Britain that enabled the production of Israel's nuclear weapons. So when our government refuses to end the trade in death that is killing tens of thousands of Palestinians, we condemn this crime. Let us also condemn another British crime. The creation, the creation of a nuclear monster in the Middle East. And we demand this, that Israel must be disarmed, that its nuclear weapons, those weapons of terror and mass destruction, must be taken away and destroyed. Because while Israel has nuclear weapons, the Middle East cannot be free and at peace. It's always so difficult when you look at the misery that is going on in Gaza. But remember this, apartheid South Africa, when the Soweto massacre took place, it was a defeat. When the Tet Offensive took place in Vietnam, they were defeated. But those were political turning points and everybody now talks about them as battles which defeated apartheid and which defeated the Americans in Vietnam. And today when we look at Gaza, we have to say the same thing. The struggles of the Palestinian people and the solidarity around the world is the thing that is going to make sure that Gaza wins and that the Palestinian people get not just a ceasefire, but get justice for the Palestinians, freedom for the Palestinians from the river to the sea. But there are also immense dangers facing us at the moment. Netanyahu knows that when this war stops, his government ends. That's why he's keeping going. 
and he's now trying, he bombed the Iranian consulate in Damascus, and now he's trying to have war with Iran. That's what he wants. The more war, the better, as far as Netanyahu is concerned. Israel has predictably doubled down on its horrific attacks. They don't care. And as long as the US, UK, and other countries keep supplying their military machine, Israel will keep their crimes. Please, don't listen to their propaganda. You don't accidentally kill over 15,000 children. You don't accidentally target refugee camps. You don't accidentally kill over 100 journalists and over 258 workers. You don't accidentally attack 36 hospitals. You don't accidentally destroy over 350,000 houses. You don't accidentally displace 2 million people. This is a targeted genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot allow Gaza to become the graveyard of international law. We cannot tolerate the destruction of Palestinian lives and livelihood any longer. It's time, it's time for us to raise our voices, to mobilize our communities, and to pressure our governments to stop arming Israel. Stop arming Israel. On this weekend, the end of the Easter holidays, on this weekend, Eid weekend, we still come, we still come. We all came for Gaza. We all came because we know this Eid that just went, or this Easter holiday that just went, we had the privilege, the privilege to sit with our friends and our families and our loved ones and our children, our nephews and our nieces. We heard and we know that that was not the case for those in Gaza. Minimum at least 33,000 Palestinians have been killed, of which over 13,000 children have been killed under this genocide. And this is why we come. This is why we came. And I'm proud of every single one of you that came, that sacrificed their time today. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Growing up in a Jewish family in London, I learned when I was young to be anti-racist, anti-fascist, and to always act in solidarity with the discriminated against and oppressed. It is because I'm an anti-racist, because I'm an anti-fascist, that I am here today to speak against those who mislead the Jewish community and who provide cover for Israeli racism and fascism. We support Palestinian resistance to occupation and oppression, and we support also those Israelis who demonstrate against war and fascism in Israel and refuse to join its army. As a teenager, I joined the anti-apartheid movement to campaign here against racist oppression in South Africa. 50 years later, I am still fighting against apartheid, but it's apartheid in Israel. Racism is always wrong. It's, it's always wrong in every circumstance. But anti-racism is not a pick and choose activity. We fight it everywhere. And the same goes for fascism. Next Friday, 19th of April, I will be remembering the courageous anti-fascists in the Warsaw Ghetto who were cut off from the world facing disease, starvation and death, and who rose up against their oppressors on that day in 1943. And Marek Edelman was second in command of the uprising. He was an internationalist, an anti-nationalist, a socialist, a human rights campaigner, and a lifelong anti-Zionist. And he died in Poland in 2009. He trained as a doctor after the war. And in the early 2000s, he corresponded with another doctor, Mustafa Barghouti, and befriended Palestinian students in Poland. Edelman said, the most important thing is life. And where there is life, the most important thing is freedom. We know who needs their dignity and freedom right now. 
And he also said, to be a Jew means always to be with the oppressed, never with the oppressors. Like Edelman, we stand with you. Solidarity. Everywhere we turn, there is a war. And in every war we look at, we find the British imperialism there. We have to fight them. And we have to stop them. This imperialism has been going on for a long, 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 long time. My own continent, Africa, has been destroyed and distracted by them. Asia, everywhere you look, you find the imperialism, the destruction of the nations, and you find the killing of innocent people. And why? Because that is capitalism. That is imperialism. And those powers, they exploit us, they kill us. So some of them, they get richer and we get poorer. Look at the number of poor people in this country. It's the same system been destructing them. It's the same system been killing the people in Sudan, in Africa, in other countries. In my own country, in Sudan, we have two generals decided to fight each other. But those generals came to power with the help of the British imperialism. We started our revolution in 2018. Millions went to the streets fighting for freedom, peace and justice. And we were killed red-handed. People shot in their heads, in their chest. The British imperialism involved and pressed on the civilians to sit with the killers. The two killers now are fighting each other. That's the nature of the capitalist system. They fight each other and they kill each other. But in that process, we pay the price. We are the civilians and we refuse that. And we say no to them and no to all oppressions and all kinds of aggressions. Let's make it clear to 10 down in the street, no wars. No armed sales and free, free Gaza. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Hello, protesters. It's me, Khitam Aliyan, who lost 50 members of my family on 21st November 23. I'm here today to share their names with you to confirm they are not numbers. My lovely dad, Abdul Aziz Aliyan. My lovely mom, Zainab Al Ghul. My brother Mahmoud Aliyan, with his wife Sally Musa, and his four children, Zain, Lubna, Kinan, and Sari. My brother Muhammad Aliyan, with his four children, Aiz, Layan, Adnan, and Adam. My sister Nisreen Abdrabu, with her six children, Hussam, Isam, Isra, Afnan, Ragad, and Misk, and three grandchildren, Ismail, Muhammad, and Wasim. My brother, Yusuf Aliyan. My sister, Jihan Al Hamalawi, with her husband, Khalid, and her two children, Lina and Musa, and her grandchildren, Lin and Yahya. My nephew, Majd Al Hajj, with his wife, with his wife, Amani Hussain, and his daughter, Sarah. My niece, Dima, Dima Al-Hajj, with her husband, Muhammad, and her son, Abdul Hakim. My nephew, Omar Al-Hajj. The list is longer. In this house, there were, there were 57 people, and this is my first family members. And due to the lack of time, I will not be able to share all of their names. I'm asking you, please, don't forget them. Thank you. Ever Alive by Fadwa Tukan. My beloved homeland, no matter how long the millstone of pain 
and agony churns you in the wilderness of tyranny. They will never be able to pluck your eyes or kill your hopes and dreams or crucify your will to rise or steal the smiles of our children or destroy and burn. Because out from our deep sorrow, out from the freshness of our spilled blood, out from the quiverings of life and death, life will be reborn in you again. Life will be reborn in you again. Thank you. We've just heard an incredibly powerful poem in memory of all those that have died in Gaza. And we had a beautifully observed to two minute silence in memory of all those lives that have been lost. Just reflect for a moment. Each of those lives that were lost meant an awful lot to a lot of other people. Each child that was lost, if their mother or father are still alive, for the rest of their lives, they'll be thinking on that child's birthday, on special days, what they would have been doing with their lives, what they would have achieved. That is the pain of war. That is the pain of the bombardment. And that is the pain that is being inflicted on the people of Gaza, increasingly on the people of the West Bank, and the pain that all those in the refugee camp suffer all the time. Globally, there have been demonstrations just about everywhere on this. Globally, there have been efforts to shut down protest. Remember, I can't even recall what, what her name was at the time, the Home Secretary that tried to ban our demonstration when we marched to the US Embassy. Um, and we used the most powerful word in politics, which Tony Benn reminded me was the case, no, we're going ahead with our demonstration. We're going ahead with our march. <clears throat> because we owe it to the people of Palestine who've been under occupation for not just a few months, but over more or less 70 years. The way in which Gaza has suffered encirclement the way in which the people of Gaza have been prevented from traveling, from working, from doing very much at all. The way the people of the West Bank have been grown, children have grown up knowing nothing other than checkpoints, military parades and military presence throughout their lives because that is what their life is about. And then when we make the very obvious call for a cease fire, that's all, a ceasefire, which means you stop shooting. It means you allow people to live. We're met with the idea that somehow or other this is dangerous and unrealistic. Well, what's dangerous and unrealistic is to kill tens of thousands of Palestinians and say that is done in self-defense. And so what this also exposes is the hypocrisy of the arms trade and the arms supplies. So when President Biden announces that he wants aid to go into Gaza and wants the US military to deliver that aid into Gaza, and he's concerned that some of the aid doesn't reach the people it ought to reach, well, who is providing the planes and the weapons that are stopping the aid getting there other than the same President Biden? And so our demand is absolutely, absolutely for a ceasefire, for a suspension of the arms trade and of the security cooperation with Israel and those mysterious flights that keep leaving REF Akrotiri, US Air Force planes that keep landing at various airfields in Britain, carrying more and more supplies that are killing, going to kill more and more people. So our demand is for an end to the arms trade as well. Now, 
as I've said before, I was there at The Hague listening to the brilliant presentation by South Africa to the International Court of Justice. And I say thank you to all those other governments around the world that joined in that application and have since added their names to it. It's very important that world opinion be known. And the International Court of Justice, the World Court, if you will, the World Court said there were acts of genocide that had to be stopped. That's what it said. That's what the interim judgment said. They are not just in breach of any decent humanitarian principles, they're in breach of international law through the ICJ and through the Geneva Convention on the Rights of People Under Occupation. So let's call it out. This whole thing is grotesquely immoral, wrong, vile and illegal. And so it is up to all of us to keep up the pressure. I know it's expensive, I know it's tiring, I know it's exhausting to go on demonstrations week after week after week. But I tell you this, in the parallel universe across the road over there, well, I'll be back in there on Monday asking questions again. In that parallel universe, I've been listening to some deeply cynical observations and conversations, not just in the last few months, but in the last few years. But I've noticed over the last weeks, few weeks, the attitude has changed. Politicians are becoming nervous of public opinion, nervous that they're on their own, nervous that they're isolated, nervous that maybe they're just plain wrong. And when they call us a march of hate, we're a march of love. We're Jewish, we're Christian, we're Muslim, we're Hindu, we're Buddhist. We're free thinkers, we're humanists, we are men, we're women, we're children, we're all ages, all ethnicities, all languages. One thing unites us, decency and humanity and a demand for peace. And in this um, incredible period of the past six months, thousands of us have come together. The pleasure of meeting each other for the first time, the pleasure of knowing the joy and the strength of doing stuff together in solidarity with those families that have lost so much, such as those brave people that spoke just before me on this. But you know what? This doesn't stop here. This is a movement for peace. This is a movement for justice. And on a day when both front benches, or yesterday rather, announced that they're in favour of raising defence expenditure to 2.5%, in favour of building more nuclear weapons and nuclear submarines, in favour of greater expenditure on arms, while our hospitals, our schools and our social services are all crying out for needs and demands and the people of this country are crying out for peace. Can't we instead change the dial, change the language and start the language of peace, of negotiation, of diplomacy, of disarmament, of hope for people all around the world and of course in this country as well. So let's continue and just let the people of Gaza and the West Bank and the refugee camps and the diaspora know you are not alone. We are here with you. We will give you our support as long as it takes until there is a free Palestine that the Palestinian people can live in, in respect and in peace. That's why we're here. That's why we'll be back. And my message to Parliament over there is we ain't disappearing. We'll be here watching what you're doing. Thank you very much.